So the title of this talk is Great Developer Steal. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with the quote uh, from the artist version, one of which uh, incarnations is here, right? The Bad Artist Imitate the Great Artist Steal by Pablo Picasso, also by Banksy, and by anybody else who wants to say it uh, in any form, language, phrasing as possible. And I think that the reason that this quote is interesting and, and the reason it gets promulgated so often is because we have these intrinsic associations with the words of use, right? Stealing, we think is bad. So if it's a great artist, why are they stealing? Is it plagiarizing? Is it straight up copying? Is it forgery, right? The interplay between what the words mean in common usage and what they imply in this particular structure is what makes this quote exciting. Um, and I, I think that, well, I hope that after this talk, you'll get a sense of how that applies to us in software development. But before I get there, we need to talk a little bit about music and how stealing works in music. Right? So I think there are, there are three main ways of stealing things in music. There's sampling, there's influence, and there's covers. And we're going to spend a little time going into each one. Sampling first. Right? Sampling is pretty much as close to stealing in music as you get, unless you actually go and steal somebody's digital masters and then sell them with your own. Um, sampling is the practice of taking a chunk of a piece of music and putting it into another piece of music. Right? The current one of the current masters of this would probably be Girl Talk. I don't know if you guys saw this infographic. Um, it was in Wired about a year ago, maybe a little more than that. And it breaks down by time signature what, or time allotment, right? What samples we're using, Girl Talk song, what it's all about. Okay? So you can see that uh, Beyonce is used from 0 to 11 seconds, and DJ Funk Snippet is 0 to 21, and it overlaps with Bill Collins is there. Right? Um, it's, it's, it is a, an amazing feat to take all of these works from other people, just tiny snippets of them, and assemble it into a new original piece of art. But if, if you look at it, right, there's actually no sound in this song that Girl Talk himself came up with. All of the sounds in it, everything that makes up the piece, comes from somewhere else. He's stolen these little pieces from elsewhere, and there are all sorts of legal issues with sampling that you know, we won't talk about. But it's just sort of a phenomenon and a feat in and of itself. So that's that's the most direct version of stealing. The least direct, I think, is influence, right? When you look at artists like Jimi Hendrix or Beatles or uh, you know, Ella Fitzgerald or Sinatra or whoever that have influences on large swaths of the music landscape. Uh, I don't know how many amazing guitarists you can ask, and they won't say that Hendrix was one of their influences. Uh, someone from whom by whom they were inspired, someone who they, they played their solos over and over again. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine, and he mentioned that jazz musicians still will try to replicate the ridiculous improvised solos that other jazz musicians do, uh, just to sort of get at the feeling underneath and, and make it their own and make it part of their own unique style. So it's not really stealing the essence, like it's not stealing the object, which is sampling. Uh, it's more stealing the underlying style and trying to make it your own. And then the last one I want to talk about are covers. Okay? The covers are weird, uh, so we're going to talk about them in a while. Uh, in fact, this is an extended metaphor, so I'm still learning something. Okay, uh, so covers, right? Covers are kind of hard to define, right? We all have an instinctual understanding of a cover is a song that was made popular by somebody and then somebody else forms it, right? But if you look at different covers, they differ in all kinds of things. Right? They, can, they can have different melodies, they can have different lyrics, they can have different styles, they can have different themes. Um, I think when you dig through all the examples, usually the lyrics are, are closest to the same, but just as a counterexample, um, the exact same words don't necessarily mean the exact same things every time they're said. Uh, who here knows Pierre Menard, author of the Cajote? Yes. Okay, so this is a short story by uh, uh, Borgia, and it's, it's actually, it's written, at, don't bother reading it, right? Uh, it's written as an academic dissertation, a study of this guy, Pierre Menard, who rewrote Don Quixote word for word, not copying Don Quixote, but he tried to get himself into the same mindset as Cervantes was 300 years earlier when he was writing it, and he tried to recreate it, but with his background, 
which meant that every word meant something completely different than what Cervantes wrote. It's this crazy, like, only Borgia could have written this, right? It, it's insane. Um, but it's the same words meaning something completely different because of the context in which they're created. And I think you can do that with, you can look at that as a way of looking at covers too, right? So you look at an easy listening cover, or an easy listening song that's covered by a death metal band, right? Same exact words, totally different meanings. I can't talk about covers without talking about bad covers. Um, I can't talk about bad covers. <laughs> I think it's only on your computers. It is lonely up here in space. <laughs> I'm such a timeless wow. friend. Yeah, okay, so that was just a, a sample of that. <laughs> and you should be grateful that it was only up here. And I'm the only one who I really had to suffer for it, except for like Jeff. But I'm sure he has this album, so. That's true. Yeah, so, uh, so bad covers can be bad in, in one of two ways, right? They can be bad aesthetically, which I think this one is, uh, or they can be bad because they don't make enough of a difference to the song. Good covers, on the other hand, uh, I think the best covers are those where uh, you really have genre bending, right? I think you can have great covers. You can have a great jazz cover by another jazz artist or a great pop song covered by another pop artist, and they can be fantastic. But the really interesting ones are where you cross genres, because different genres are good at, at expressing different things. Right? You don't listen to easy listening when you're in a suicidal mood, right? You listen to death metal. Not that everyone who listens to death metal is suicidal. But that, that's just the, the idea, right? So it's, it's really useful to pay attention to genre. Um, and this, again, is where you get the same song expressing something completely different. So this is Frank Sinatra's version of well, not his version, right? But this is Lucky Lady at Night, which person I'm just saying in Guys and Dolls, uh, covered in 1993 by the Toadies before they got big. Um, it's obviously very different than Frank Sinatra ever would have sung it. And it, actually, I picked it because when, in 1993, I was running a movie theater, and this guy brought in a two CD album set of covers of Frank Sinatra by punk and alternative rock bands. And it was filled with really good covers, like this one, where they sort of made the song their own, and they used it to express emotions that Sinatra would not have. Uh, and it was filled with really bad covers, too, where you actually had punk bands trying to croon Frank Sinatra songs. I, I, I did not actually uh, include any of those covers, so you can all thank me for it. Um, I can't really talk about covers, though, without talking about one other way of stealing, but this is even less like stealing than anything else, right? Standards, right? And covers only came into existence in the 50s. Before that, and in certain genres, songs don't really belong to people as much. I mean, legally they do. But in like the 30s, a popular song would immediately be re-recorded by 18 different other artists. And you would go to the record store and say, I want this song, not I want Bing Crosby's original song. It was, a, it was a very different way of looking at the world. And jazz still has that, right? There are tons of jazz standards that every jazz musician worth their salt has recorded because they want to make it their own, or it expresses something fundamental about human condition, or whatever, right? Standards are sort of, are, they're universal in an interesting way, right? So that's it for the, the diversion, the digression, the metaphor of music, except it'll pop up back up. In software, in software, <laughs> in software, uh, I think we have exact analogs for each of those, sampling, influence, uh, covers, and, and standards. Right? And those are libraries, influence, ports, and patterns. Libraries are you're using other people's code, or maybe your own code from the past, and right? you're reusing it in a new context. Um, you could, like Girl Talk, create an application entirely composed of other people's code. That would actually be really cool, and I'd love to see a, a Rails Rumble like competition where you didn't get to write any code of your own, you just got to glue together pieces that other people have built. Um, does that exist? That's great. Right. It's Rails. It's Rails? It's pretty much what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so other than, than pointing that out, I don't think library usage as stealing is particularly interesting. Uh, influence is a little more interesting because we see it a lot. Right? So here's an example: X unit, right? The X unit pattern. Um, it started way back when, when Kent Beck was working with small talk programmers. He'd come into a team 
And the first thing he would have them do is write their own test framework. Um, every team wrote a different version of this S unit, uh, and it was good. And Kent looked upon it and saw that it was good. <laughs> but, but there was no, there, there was no one S unit, right? Every single team had their own different version of it. Uh, one time, one, one stormy night, I went to a manager with stormy, I don't really know why. Kent Beck and Eric Gamble were sitting next to each other on a small plane flying across the Atlantic to Germany. Um, and they decided, as they were wont to do, to program something. So they, they wrote J unit, which was a distillation of the ideas in, in S unit written into Java. So they didn't actually take any code from S unit. Uh, they didn't look at the code in S unit and port it over it. They just took the ideas, moved them over, and moved them in for Java. And so there's a very clear, uh, actually, it's kind of self influence, right? If, if Gamma had written it by himself, it would have been pure influence with Kent not involved, but since Kent was there, it's. I'm classifying that as influence. So ports, I think, are the closest thing we have to copy, to covers. Um, and as we'll see, there can be both good covers and bad covers, and good ports and bad ports. Uh, keeping with the X unit example, we've got S unit influencing the development of J unit. And then you've got N unit. Who here has used N unit, version one? OK, so it's, I haven't. Right? It, but it is my understanding that N unit version one was a line by line port of J units to the, and translation into C sharp to the extent that there were lines of code, there were chunks of code that only actually applied to Java programs and would never be executed in any situation in .NET. Um, so I would classify it as a bad cover, right? Because they, they, took, they took the artifact and they just translated it directly over into this new artifact that was good, but it, it wasn't idiomatic.NET and it wasn't useful for all of .NET and it had all this cruft in it that they just didn't get rid of. A better cover or port is Michael Feather's CDD unit. So he knew JUnit, he was working in C++, and he ported it, but not by copying it line by line across, right? He just, again, he took the ideas and possibly, not uh, clearly not code, right, because it's Java and C++, but implementation details he translated directly across. And I think just as we look at covers and genre, different genres are good at expressing different things, Different languages in programming are good at expressing different things. Sure, every Turing complete language can do everything any other Turing complete language can do, but tell me that you wouldn't rather write, write telco software in Erlang than you would in JavaScript. Right? <laughs> it's, it's, they're, they're good for different things. They make certain practices expressive or not. Um, it's, we're here writing Ruby. Right? If, is that a stretch or a question? Stretch, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if they were all completely you know, equal, then it wouldn't matter what we were all doing independently, right? We could still come to every single conference and get the same amount out of it. So, the equivalent to standards, I would say, are patterns, right? These are things that you're not necessarily copying, but you either arrive at independently. Before the Gang of Four wrote their book, all the patterns existed, and they were being used out there in the world. They were just codifying and, and identifying. They were, they were making a dictionary, not writing your research. Right, does that make sense? So we can look at, at something uh, like the data mapper pattern, two words, or for my friends who think it's only one word, uh, and I use the, the number to indicate that it's actually the pattern, right? You look at the data mapper pattern, data mapper pattern, and you can see it in the wild in various contexts, right? So there's data mapper one word in Ruby. There's also data mapper one word in PHP, which I didn't know about until like last night, which PHP is weird. Um, there's <laughs> one mapper, uh, and there's SQL Alchemy, which has the ORM part of it is, is modeled on data mapper principles, right? They're, they're all illustrations of the same pattern, though it's not necessarily the case that any developer of one of them was looking at the code that the other's written. They, they were just looking at the, the pattern itself. So with that sort of structure, I want to look at the genealogy of some software and show you where things have been influenced and where things have been stolen, stolen and where things have been covered. Uh, and we can start with BDD. So in the beginning, there was JBehave, which was the outcome of conversations that Dan North had with various other people. Um, and Dan North saw it, and it was good. Um, from conversations around JBehave and being near the development of it and being talking to all the appropriate people, uh, Stephen, who spoke earlier, uh, wrote the first version of RSpec, which then sort of took those principles in a slightly different way. Um, Dan North actually came back into the picture and wrote RBehave, which was a Ruby port of JBehave that eventually grew into Square Runner and Cucumber. Um, 
Then you've got PHP spec that was derived from R spec and Jasmine, which drew from at least four different frameworks uh, to provide BDD for JavaScript. And, and this is my corporate slide. Um, <laughs> so, so up at the top you've got the CEO or the idea, which is BDD. That sort of led to JBehave, or JBehave was the first emergence of it. Uh, that influenced the development of both RSpec and RBehave. RSpec then splintered and actually did way more than just these three, uh, the two the JavaScript ones and the PHP one. Uh, it influenced the development of all these and they came back in to form Jasmine. Uh, RBehave itself grew into Story Runner, which then was rewritten. Uh, I think this is actually two rewrites. So RBehave was rewritten into Story Runner, which was included in RSpec, and it was rewritten into Cucumber, which we all know and love. So I, I think for most software, you can probably create a crazy corporate org chart of its history like this. I'm not going to do any more of those. No more slides. <coughs> Rails clearly has been ported or copied or maligned uh, as you like it. Um, we start with Rails. KPHP. So I think around version like 0.8.2 or something of Rails, KPHP came along and said, hey, that's a really good idea. Let's do that in PHP. And for a while, Rails would release a new feature, and a month later, KPHP would drop a new version that included that feature. It was like clockwork. Um, it, was, it was really kind of sad for the KPHP folks. Uh, I guess they were happy they were writing PHP. Yeah. Um, but but since then, I, it is my understanding that KPHP has evolved in its own direction. But for a while, it was a very direct cover, and I would argue a bad cover of Rails. Uh, perhaps even worse is Groovy on Rails. Right? All they did was put a stick and G in front of it and said, hey, we've got our own thing. But in fact, it obviously is just a port. Uh, right on Rails was written by Steve Yeggy. Uh, it's JavaScript version of Rails, which is, I don't know why you do that. Um, and then <laughs> the first time I started talking about this stuff, I was talking to one of my, my friends who's a .NET developer. I did call him my friend, an acquaintance who was a .NET developer. Um, and he said, oh my god, ASP.NET steals everything. And he proceeded to list off, you know, Hibernate? Yeah, we have in Hibernate. And whatever we have in whatever, et cetera. Um, and in fact, yes? You omitted the Wheels framework, which is uh, Rails on Cold Fusion. Wheels is Rails on Cold Fusion. <laughs> you, you think I admitted that accidentally? <laughs> <laughs> so so you think that was an accidental omission? <laughs> okay, uh, so ASP.NET MVC came out uh, like a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. And in fact, it took a lot of its ideas from existing frameworks, uh, MVC, whether they're you know officially MVC or not. Um, it re-implemented a lot of those ideas. Some of that, I'm sure, is, is trying to implement the same pattern. Some of it is, is just straight up copying. Um, Whiskey, do you guys know Whiskey? Yeah. Oh, a couple, a couple of them. All right, so Whiskey is from Python. Uh, there was a guy, actually we heard about it earlier, right? Uh, we had Pat Paul up here. Uh, I don't know where he went, but yeah. So a Python programmer was reading the circle at API and said, hey, that sounds cool, except it's Java and I do Python. So he wrote the WSGI spec. WSGI is itself a spec. It is not executable code. Um, the first Python framework that implemented it, it, it was Paste. Paste has since been upgraded. Now they have WebOB, which is a fun word to say. And I think that's why they updated Paste, because WebOB is much more fun to say. Uh, Christian Wickerton saw the WSGI spec and said, hey, that's awesome. I'm going to make it rack. And it's in Ruby, and it, and it blew up, right? We'll talk more about that in just a second, but rack is, is awesome. Uh, in JavaScript, you have Jizgy and Jack. In Perl, you have Jizgy and Plack. And in Haskell, you have Hack2, uh, which is actually the successor to Hack, no number, um, which is what I like to call that. Okay, code examples. Right. So, Whiskey is a spec. This is the code example that is included in the Whiskey spec in the PEP. Right? The PEP URL is over there in the corner. All the slides will be on the web, and you can see the URLs in the corner. Um, this looks fairly familiar, right? If we're all familiar with Rack. This looks pretty similar. Yeah. We've got a status, and we've got headers, and we've got a body. A little different. There's this weird start response thing. I don't know. Um, web op. It's not working. Uh, so this is the current implementation of WSGI that most of Python uses. Apparently, uh, I think it came from pylons, but it looks identical, right? Environment start response is just smoothed down. Rack we all know and love. Here we get rid of start response, so we just have the environment hash, and then we return status headers body. Jack actually has changed since the last time I gave this talk. It used to be a, an array, now it returns a JavaScript object right, with status, headers, and body. Looks very similar to Rack. Plaq looks identical to Rack, except being in Perl, which is a crappy language in and of itself. <laughs> Sorry to whoever liked it earlier. Um, right, but it's the same thing. I, I, I kid. I love Perl when I can read it, which is kind of 
So in hack, we have you need a, 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 a drummer or two. Like, we're going to my awful jokes. That would be great. OK, so hack is in Haskell. Actually, I find this even harder to read than Perl. Um, but it, it, you, you can see what's going on, right? There's a response, 200 status, headers, and, and string, right? So we have a clear pattern here. We also have a pattern in the naming. So a quick interlude on naming. Notice that most of these were called acts, right? Jack, Black, Hack2. I'm sure there's, actually, I'm sure there's not a knack, but there would be if that net didn't have a server built in. Um, That's Node. Node? Knack. Knack? Uh, yeah. um, so they're all named after Rec, whereas some of them, we have some things named after Whiskey. When I gave this talk the first time, there was no Jisby, so it was just Whiskey and Pisky. Also fun words to say. Um, <laughs> right, so, so the, the idea here is that you can trace genealogy by looking at the names people use. So, I bet you that plaque was written by someone who was not being inspired directly by whiskey, but was being inspired by rack. Right? That, that's the end of that interlude. So Sinatra, we all know and love Sinatra. Sinatra also has, I, I, I'm going to make this claim, and I have no evidence to back it up, but you're not going to, yeah, whatever. Uh, Sinatra is the most copied so web software in the world. That's my claim. Because if you look at any language, there are at least half a dozen clones of Sinatra. Most of them are like somebody started to do it because it looked easy and they stopped, but they're there. Right? So uh, let's look at these. Rat Pack, Flask, Slim, and Nancy. I could have put like, twice as many on there without a problem. Sinatra, we know, uh, so you can render a template, you can pull a param out of the, the URL, and you can process uh, post it, and you've got request body and blah, blah. Rat Pack is the Groovy version. Shockingly, it looks so much like the Ruby version, um, except you have to set a template root. Flask is the Python version. Um, it's a, a little more crufty, and it's got, you know, four spaces to indent because it's Python. Um, right, but it does the same stuff. Slim is a, P a PHP version. I think there are more PHP versions of it than anything else. Um, oh, that's probably a mistake. It shouldn't be slim, full, full, or it should be dollar app rendered. But, um, yeah, it looks like PHP. Nancy, this one's shocking. This is the .NET version of Sinatra. This is all. There's not like eight, eight, eight screens of configuration and import crap in front of them. This is all it is. It, they actually did a really good job of this. And I, my hat is off to the Nancy people. Um, so uh, again, on naming, again, notice we've got Flask, Clear Association with Sinatra, Nancy, Sinatra, uh, Slim, which I guess is a nickname for one of the Rat Pack, Rat Pack. There's also Fitzgerald. There's Blue Eyes, which is a small framework. There's, uh, what? Sammy JS, yep. Um, so a lot of them are named according to Rat Pack members of Sinatra himself. Um, <coughs> the first Scala framework that was a port of Sinatra, does anybody know what it was called? So there's Blue Eyes now, which is more popular. But the first Scala framework was named Scalatra. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they kind of missed the boat on the source of the names there. But yeah, okay. So, so we've seen lots of examples of, why, uh, of people actually stealing. Why should you, therefore, go out and steal? Everybody else is doing it. If, if I told you everybody else was jumping off a bridge, would I expect you to? No, but you should steal. <laughs> there are three, three reasons to, to look at taking ideas and code from other languages and other places and making them your own. The first is opportunity. So you're out learning language. You see something awesome. You say, hey, that's cool shit. I wish I had that cool shit in one of my work and it worked. You steal it. Okay. Um, you guys know Web Machine? Yeah, uh, yeah, I know Steve knows Web Machine. Okay. So Web Machine is written in Erlang, and it's it's awesome, it's super cool, and Sean Cripps, who works for Basho, and uses Erlang a lot, saw it and saw, hey, I wish Ruby had something like that. So he created Web Machine Ruby, which is awesome, and you should look at it. Um, it's, it's, if, if you like Steve's talk on hypermedia APIs, Web Machine is where you should look. The second reason to steal stuff is to educate yourself. And this is kind of reversing things. It's not you find something to copy, uh, in this case, you want I want to learn Python for what ungodly reason, I don't know. Um, and so I decide I'm going to learn it by implementing something in it that I already know how to implement. And this is the, the blog, everybody knows how to write a blog, so when you learn a new language or a web framework, you go to write a blog in it. Right? Um, in real life, well, in, in non-software, I guess software is real life, in, in non-software language stuff, right? When I needed to refresh my Italian before going on my honeymoon, I got the Harry Potter books in Italian and read them because I know the Harry Potter books really, really well. And so I was able to, to actually learn some Italian by reading them. Oh, philosophy means philosopher. I know that now, right? So this is a great strategy. I highly recommend it if you're trying to learn another language. Pick a book you know really well, get in that language and read it. 
What's that? On tape. On tape. Yeah, if you want to speak it. I actually don't like talking to people, so. <laughs> okay. So uh, the reason I, I I think the most interesting reason is is need driven, right? Need driven theft. It's like I need to to feed my family, so I'm going to steal some bread, um, or I need to solve a really hard problem in my language. I'm going to go out and look for a solution and steal it from somebody else. Um, so a case here would be like I, I did some iOS work a while ago, and this was before testing was easy in iOS, right? Um, so somebody said, I have a need to unit test the crap out of my iOS projects. Um, there's no answer for that in, in, in Cocoa right now. So I'm going to look around, and there's no good answer. Uh, and I guess he was familiar with Ruby, and he, he's looked at RSpace and said, that's really cool. I wonder if I can port that over. And he did, and now there's a project called Cedar that is RSpec-like testing for iOS. It's really cool um, if you do iOS stuff. Does anybody here use Cedar? No? Okay, somebody knows <laughs> iOS, go out, use Cedar, and tell me how cool it is. Uh, preferably very, but moderately would be acceptable. Okay, so uh, you have a need. How do you then proceed with your thefting? Thiefing, thieving, thieving, that's the word. Thirving? Burgling. Burgling. Burgling is good. I like burgling. I don't like actually burgling. I like the word burgling. I like, I like burgling. Okay, scare quotes make everything better. Where to look for stuff to steal? So I think in Ruby we're sort of blessed in that we can look to a lot of different languages to steal things, and it will be relatively easy to steal it. We can look at functional languages because we're kind of functional. We can certainly look at object-oriented languages. Uh, we can look at prototype languages if we want to do something crazy and just use eigenclasses. And, and you know, yeah. And I think I just made Evan cry a little bit. <laughs> Was it because of the word or because of the suggestion that people should do it? Just a suggestion. Okay. Don't don't look at prototypal languages uh, unless you're stealing stuff from JavaScript. Okay. All right. Cool. <laughs> okay. I'm going to stamp Evan's approval on that slide. Okay. So where do you look once you decide? Yeah, I want to look around. GitHub, Bitbucket, Google Code, and if you're desperate, SourceForge. Um, right. The, the Sinatra examples. Uh, if I recall correctly, I found them by typing Sinatra into GitHub and then just skipping over all the Ruby ones. Even though I could have done an entire slide of just Ruby ports of Sinatra, which. Is Sinatra, but apparently people didn't think I was good. <laughs> uh, the other place, there are places for specific languages to look. Um, all right. uh, there are places for individual languages that you can look for more. Right. So if you're trying to steal from Ruby, go look at Ruby If you're trying to steal from Python, Peps and PyPy. Uh, CPAN obviously is a great idea of all package repositories. I bet you for any given language other than like some language I don't know. You can find a repository of all the packages and look at it and steal stuff. Once you see stuff, how do you know if it's any good? Well, uh, you can look at the activity of the repository. If they have edge case testing, that means that somebody's actually hit the edge cases, which means that somebody's using it. Um, the citations are being used in other projects are a good way to tell if it's worthwhile. Documentation and history are <coughs> extremely important when you're looking for ideas because they document the ideas and they show you how things evolved over time, so you can perhaps avoid potholes in your stealing and porting it to your own language. The strong opinions is an interesting one. I hate Hamel. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff loves Hamel. Oh, I like you. So. <coughs> Excuse my cough. Um, projects that in, incite strong opinions in people are interesting and worthy of further discussion. Third and final interlude, the mathematics of beauty. You guys know OkCupid, the dating site? Right. So they have a blog called OkTrends, which is amazing. They take their reams of data and they analyze it and tell you cool stuff. Uh, there's a post called the mathematics of beauty where they show that profile pictures, you can rate a profile picture one to five, right? One is ugly and five is hot. Um, pictures of people that are rated uniformly high, like average of four and most of the ratings are four, they get X amount of messages per week, which is the average. Pictures where they average four, but they're split between fives and ones, they get like three X. And there are lots of reasons why. Read the post, it's super cool. But it, we're drawn to things where people have diverging opinions, and it's there, it's profitable to look for deeper understanding of those events, and those places, and that software, and those people. Okay, so almost done. What to do? You found your project, how do you seal it? Well, you can steal it line by line, like in unit version one. I do not recommend that. Um, that gets you, that's like cargo culting, right? Is I'm going to do exactly the same things they did, just 
translating the syntax over to my language uh, and think it's going to be good. It's actually not going to be good. You're not actually going to understand it. So what I do recommend is acceptance testing. We're talking about fairly large chunks of code uh, that have definable inputs and outputs, so it should be relatively easy to write acceptance tests in whatever language you like, cucumber, whatever. Uh, run it against the original code. So if you're still in Python, run your acceptance tests against that code, and then you write your Ruby version to make match the same acceptance tests. Right? So what you're doing is you're copying the intent of the code, not the actual mechanics of the code. And that's it. Thank you.